Entre la fecha que es. ¿Está? Sí, está ya. Va a ir, pero creo que online. Online. Yo venía aquí la primera pensando que iba a estar esto aquí. Y te lo bañó y que decía que no me cuenta que hago me. Al revés, al revés. Y aquí como se ya del grupo. Nada, pues muy bien. Igual cuando es online la gente. A ver. ¿Cómo puedo.? Hey. One minute. But maybe. Because I, I don't see any. Do I need to accept people to enter in the room? I don't think so. Uh, Jose. I think. Está todo montado, eh? Ay, vale. Bueno, I think with the laser you won't see much. You have two spectat spectators online already. Two? Okay. Almost as many as here. Is that? Yeah. Well. Uh, well, we wait for Ricardo, at least. Yes. I, I told I was supposed to be here. Uh, I want to see who are the expected. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is. Lipet is one, Iran two, Ilenka. Ah, Lenka. Ah, Lenka. I'm probably there. Hey, hi, Lenka. They are listening to us. Hi, Lenka. <laughs> <laughs> The, the only thing I won't see the chat. Okay, I will. I'm gonna put it here in case somebody asks. Um. Y no empezamos. Eh? Empezamos. Sí, luego damos un par de minutos de cortesía que solemos dar, pues no sé. Vale. Ya no era lo del café de, de la secretaria que era técnico. Bueno, no me dijo que iba a venir. Tiene que haber hablado. Sí, hola, sí, muy bonito. Hola, te está cogiendo un café. Sí. Bueno, eso es Coimbra. Lisboa. Lisboa. Es, bueno, es a las afueras de Lisboa, en Oiras. No, es, un, sí, sí, es sí, como. Sí. No sé. Eh, como Zarao. Un poco más cerca. Sí, el pero de visitantes, es una cosa de turista, que es un no nuestro. Está este y el. ¿Cómo era el otro? Bueno, y el IEM. Y el IEM, sí, pero es. Eh... Es que yo vengo de ahí. <risa> <risa> vale, 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 vale. Vale, sí. Instituto de Medicina Molecular. Sí, 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 el IEM, sí. Hay una red. Eh, que hay un montón. Sí, Colai, para se han juntado, se expone todo. Colai, sí, sí, sí. Están aquí ya saliendo, pero sí, está a tope, pero bueno, tiene mucho que trabajar. Y la chica que estaba ahí eh, se va ahora, ya. Así que no sé. Eh... Hola, no sabía. Sí. Eh, no sé, bueno, se va a algún centro de investigación, todavía no ha dicho o sea, dónde. Se lleva todo, ahora no me acuerdo cómo se llama, pero. Eh, Tiene un nombre portugués como... Eh, no me salí. Juego que tuvo un niño hace poco. Sí, sí, sí. Igual por eso. Eh, 
No, 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 no porque, porque él ha salido un puesto. O sea, como tiene, como controla todos los centros de investigación, va a tener un puesto similar como más político, pero en uno de los centros. Lo que pasa es que no ha dicho más. Eh, su chico se llama. Está online esto, además. Tiago y. Yo voy en Corea porque. Con eh, como con toda la gente que venía de Ucrania, han venido un montón de estudiantes de doctora y postdocs. Entonces, Colife ha sido eh, los que han estado gestionando eh, dónde podían entrar en los institutos y así. Y lo lleva esta chica, y no me acuerdo de su nombre. No, me contarás en mitad de la charla, ya verás. Sí, sí, es que además hablo un montón con ella. Bueno, ya lo sí. A ver, subimos. No sé, sí. ¿No? Para que se vea. Sí, sí, sí. sí. Ahí te ve la cámara. Ok. So, hello everybody and welcome for, uh, to this talk and thank you for coming on this special date. Uh, it is uh, a real pleasure for me to introduce you today Estivalis. She's uh, a colleague and a friend now for a few years. She's um, a mathematician by education uh, here at the UPV in, in the U. And then she, she is her master uh, thesis on, in the Complutense. And now her PhD thesis in the Universidad Carlos III in, in Madrid, working in, uh, in my field biomedical uh, computer vision, or what we call bioimage analysis. So I'm looking forward to hear what she has to tell us about her uh, past and new endeavors. So I hope you yeah. will like it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so um, thank you for coming. I know the dates are quite uh, complicated at the moment. Um, so yeah, it's it's very nice to be here because well at, at the end I'm from Bilbao. I studied at the university here and, and after I think eight years, it's it's kind of yeah nice to to get back uh, from a different let's say site or, or perspective. Um, so now I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Instituto Gulbenkian de Ciencia. I I did math, but I changed a bit the topic. So I'm learning a lot of uh, biology, a lot of uh, computer vision, uh, of course, and all these kind of things. And um, let me maybe uh, talk a little bit about the institute where I work. I don't know where, maybe I please here. I don't know because I don't want to be in front of the slides. Um, so the Instituto Gulbenkian de Ciencia, it's, it's uh, research center that uh, belongs to a private uh, foundation, the Fundação Carlos de Gulbenkian, and it's basically for biomedical research. So this means that there are, of course, many biologists working on uh, development of biology, morphogenesis, evolution, uh, immunology, and so on. But there are also many biophysicists uh, working on more, um, they call the physics of life. So a lot of modeling, a lot of uh, genetical um, uh, uh, research and, and these type of things. And uh, what the group where I'm working is uh, Ricardo Enrique's group. It's called Optical Cell Biology Group. And it's a bit more uh, from, I would say, a little bit more like engineering, right? So we do, Ricardo is an expert in uh, developing software for super resolution microscopy, but also a little bit of hardware, a little bit of uh, microfluidics. Uh, he's also developing tools for deep learning and uh, biomedical analysis, focusing on, on leaf cell imaging. And in the lab, uh, we have an optics lab, we have, of course, the bench, and then we have uh, some uh, little space uh, for, for computer uh, science or more uh, like uh, image analysis things. And um, he, his main uh, direction now in, in the group is to develop a smart image acquisition microscopy. So this means like uh, trying to understand uh, what we see when we are acquiring images and to explore it so the microscope can make decisions. And this involves understanding cell biology, uh, preventing uh, phototoxicity, and also being able to, to kind of predict what could happen. So, so we are working in all these different directions, biologists, physicists, engineers, mathematicians. And uh, 
because I started uh, a year ago and I got my, my own uh, postdoctoral fellowship. Uh, I started in September. I don't have much to show about what I've been doing in the lab. So I will show what, what I did previously in my PhD and what are kind of the, the, the things we are playing around now, but that I'll, I'll show you uh, at the end. So, yeah, so in my PhD, I, I work studying cancer cell motility. So cancer is one of the leading uh, uh, reasons for, for, for dying in worldwide, I, I think that we know. And uh, of course, it's very interesting to, to understand um, why our cells go into metastasis. And one of the critical components in metastasis is that when, when cancer cells, they decide to migrate, they, they do it in a very specific way. So if we understand what makes them uh, uh, moving to, to adjacent organisms, or what are the mechanisms of cell motility, then we can uh, design uh, drugs that better target, right? Uh, the, 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 the motility, or, or at least try to, to reduce it. So that was that is the motivation of my PhD thesis. And uh, well, to give you a little bit of context, um, so when we study leaf cell imaging, usually researchers, they, they put cells in two dimensional substrates and they let cells moving around and they study how they behave and how they move. But in reality, cells, they move in 3D extracellular matrices. So we have uh, different uh, proteins like collagen, elastin, and uh, cells, they basically get attached to these fibers and they exert movements and, and they migrate. And this is called mesenchymal migration. And um, one of the reasons why this type of motility is not that much studied is because conducting these kind of experiments in the lab is much more complicated and also analyze the need and, and, and developing three-dimensional models. So that uh, is the first uh, focus of the thesis, trying to, to understand better what happens in this scenario rather than in the two-dimensional one. And well, um, one of the things we, we, we see when, when we let these cells um, migrating in the three-dimensional matrix is that rather than being flat, they have this kind of elongated shape. And this elongated shape is composed by uh, branching forms that are called dendritic protrusions. So these are like arms for the cells, like if they were monkeys in the forest, right, that they attach to the trees and they make forces to move. Um, if well, if you if you are interested about more the the protein components of these branches, so the cell it has the nuclei, it has the microtubules that is like the skeleton of the of the cell, and then the actin that is uh, what composes the membrane. Let's let's call it like that. And these protrusions they are composed by both the actin and the and the microtubules, so they are like uh, strong components to to really make forces. And there are these little uh, philopodia that are more like, like fingers, that they, they don't have that many microtubules. And we are interested in these ones. And this is what precedes my, my PhD thesis, to know how they use them actually to, to, to create the movement. And um, this was uh, a study that uh, Hasini Hayatelaka, she was a PhD student of Denny Wirtz, then he's my uh, PhD co-supervisor. So what she did is manually count each of these uh, protrusions and she defined their branching structure as we have the mother protrusion and then the doctors. And she saw that uh, the number of protrusions being generated on time is it correlates with the with the velocity of the of the cells when they are migrating. So then the question arises: what is really the, the role of, of these protrusions and how can we characterize it? And then is when it comes to 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 do image analysis because of course we want to optimize it, but we want to quantify, to extract quantitative met metrics about uh, the tracking and about uh, all these protrusions. And that's how uh, my PhD um, thesis main topic was conceived. So um, what, what is the setup and what are we going, how are we gonna approach it? So we have our cells embedded in a 3D substrate and we are only going to, to see one focus of plane. So here we see some of the cells migrating in, in, in X and Y directions. And uh, here you can say, well, these images are really horrible. Why don't you use fluorescence? And the main reason is because if you really want to see um, a, a very directed movement, you need to, to see your cells for at least 16 hours or 10 hours. 
if you are imaging with fluorescence for that amount of time, you will probably fry yourself. So you will induce a lot of photo damage and you will intercede in the metabolism of the cell. So then uh, we go into phase contrast, but because we have collagen matrices here, we have a lot of artifacts and say to noise ratio is not good. And then of course, because these uh, cells are migrating in 3D, but we are only seeing the two dimensional plane. There are many um, uh, uh, shapes and, and protrusions for which we have uncertainty a long time, and we want to track them. So we really need to to we really need to to work on on an algorithm that is able to deal with this inconsistency, with the artifacts, with the heterogeneity of the different uh, uh, collagen uh, matrices. Additionally, maybe maybe you you know if you work with uh, people from from materials when you try to build up collagen matrices, polymerization is really unstable. So depending on the day, the humidity, the temperature, the people, the people doing the, the, the matrix, it will look in one way or the other way. So, so it's uh, all the images are quite heterogeneous. And this then uh, seems to be like the ideal uh, case to use some deep learning, right? So, so that's uh, also um, what uh, was back in the time was like the hot topic. So, okay, let's, let's try to see if we are able to define a, a pipeline or a method to analyze these images automatically, knowing what we know already about, about the cells and, and the setup. So uh, what is a deep learning model? I don't, do you all know what is the deep learning model here? Mm -hmm. No? <laughs> yes? Okay, I will very briefly explain it. Uh, so basically, uh, we have a model that is uh, initialized randomly. So it's, it's a set of parameters, right, that we need to train. And, these models, they learn from data. So we don't need to give exact definitions or models of what we want to analyze. So this means that we give the input images and what we expect from these input images. And the model, it outputs something randomly at the beginning. And what we do is we compute the loss between like a, a, a cost function between this output and what should be the ideal output. And then we back propagate this loss. We say, okay, you didn't do it well. So you need to update the parameters here. And this, you do it thousands of times. And then at the, at the end, the, the network, it learns what should be the, the output from the given images. And then is when we say that our network is trained and, and has already learned to perform the task. And then uh, we have, we, we, we evaluate whether the, the results we can trust them are robust and all these type of things. And then we have a, a model trained that we can use to analyze all the bunch of data that, that we have for our experiments. And uh, for this, there's one key thing that we need to define the ground truth. And this, it sounds um, kind of a, a straightforward task, but for this problem, it was not, and it took us many, many years to really be able to define what was mathematically correct to, to extract from the data and biologically relevant. Um, so given these images, we can segment them. Okay, here there's some uncertainty, but different people segmented the same image and then we do an average and that's okay. But then to define what is a protrusion, it was not that clear. So biologists, they were like, no, no, all this thing here is a protrusion, you just write the limit here. That limit doesn't exist in nature. So then you cannot pretend that a mathematical method is able to learn something that it doesn't exist. Uh, so then we say, okay, what we are going to do is just um, pinpoint with landmarks the extrema and, and okay, the branching structure, we can kind of estimate it with a reference point, and that's what we are going to analyze. Uh, we won't try to analyze the protrusion as this is an arm and this is a body because that was not mathematically well defined, and that it really took us uh, quite a long time. So if you work with biological data, this is something to, to take into account how to properly defined uh, a mathematical task. Um, so then uh, together with uh, Osgun Sisek and uh, Thomas Brox at the University of Freiburg, we uh, developed, uh, well, it took us, of course, many uh, trials and uh, um, we tried different architectures and things, but we at the end, at the end defined this architecture that what it does is um, it takes a video where we see some movement. And we analyze each of the images of this video independently in our network. So we use an encoder decoder. Basically, we the network learns to extract the features that are relevant from the image and then to synthesize them to give kind of a mask. And the idea is that here we uh, um, we, we want just one mask, okay, from for the output. 
we have different time points and the idea is that with a recurrent uh, layer the model should be able to to project this movement and and here you may say okay this is one one way you could do it uh, the reason is when we were annotating the data we really needed to see the movement to determine what was a protrusion and what not in, instead of an artifact so that's why we really wanted to to provide uh, the network with some velocity or uh, sorry with some movement uh, data to analyze the images so this work uh, pretty well what well, we use uh, a pre-trained encoder but this is quite common at the moment um and the results were quite nice i should say we tried different uh, compositions for the architecture we did uh, the cross validation and then uh, of course the accuracy metrics are not very good but this is for the whole image take into account that there's a lot of uh, background compared to the actually the objects we want to segment so the accuracy metrics they will be always uh, quite low um, but um, with this we were able to track our cells and of course to extract morphological parameters so here it was quite simple if we have um, for the landmarks of the of the protrusions if we have our mask then we can uh, define a skeleton for it so we have the branches and the landmarks here for the extrema that we can define as, as protrusions. And then if you want to uh, extract some um, uh, morphological metrics, there are many distances, many distance transformations you can use. So the Euclidean distance will give you, for example, what is the center of mass that is expected to be the nuclei. So then you have a reference point to define a Gaussian distance and then uh, define the length uh, of your protrusion. So with this, we could already with the landmarks struck all the information we wanted about protrusions and we didn't need to define this is the arm this is the other arm and, and these kind of things um so finally we have the landmarks we can track them because we don't have uh two uh, a very high cell density is quite straightforward to 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 um track this this nuclei with uh well in this case we use trackmate it's a plugin in in fiji fiji is a, a software for image analysis and it was the same for the protrusion. So now this is the way it looks uh, a cell in movement, right? So we have uh, our cell and it's generating protrusions and this is the ground truth in different directions and we can track them in time. This is what we calculated. So it's not exactly the same, of course, because the network is not as fine as maybe we as annotator were, but the, the results were quite consistent with the ground truth. It's true that the, again, the 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 metrics here were not very um good but when we compared with the variability of the humans annotating the data that was also uh, they, they had a lot of variability so so then we were kind of okay with these results and now is when the fun comes right because we need to use this data to extract some knowledge so the first thing we can do is okay we can differentiate between cells that have a mitosis and don't so then um we can actually see that the cells after mitosis they they move quite fast and this is something that we see when we look at the data but it was not really characterized and this could be a the next line uh, for for uh, Dennis lab uh, uh, research uh, to see why why these cells you know they when when they split and they do it in 3D they go right in opposite directions and, and move quite fast compared to 2D um, this uh, we can see it with the mean square displacement but also we can uh, compute the effective displacement of a cell. This kind of metric is not that common in biology. They like this, um, I don't know, accumulated uh, mean square displacement that I don't really understand why they like it. But um, um, so, so I decided to work more on, okay, after 16 hours, did the cells really had a, a directed movement or not? And then we can say this cell has a more uh, mitotic uh, metastasic uh, phenotype and, and whatnot. So this was nice, but then we are again interested in, in knowing how cells use these protrusions and how is the relationship between the protrusions and form and the and the motility. So what we see is that those um, cells that are moving quite a long distance, so the distance between this point and this point is quite high, they form a very, very long protrusions that they stay also long in time. So, so then those protrusions are more persistent than the others uh, from the cells that are not moving that much. Um, if we look at cells independently, uh, this, um, well, the first thing we need to, to, to see is that we are able to, 
to uh, recover the uh, patterns that are stated in the in the um, literature, right? And these cells, when they move, they are uh, assumed to polarize. So one protrusion in the leading edge, one in the rear, and then they make this directed movement, and that is called polarization. Okay, and this is what we have here, and we can recover that from the data. And this cell here uh, in the video is moving quite a significant distance and it's having that pattern. But what we also see in the, in the images is that it might be that the cell polarizes, but it doesn't really move. So polarization doesn't always mean uh, a, a movement, an effective movement. And that is something uh, that is interesting from the biological side, because then are those protrusions in the polarization different than the ones involved in the movement? Is their stiffness the same? Is not? And so on and so on. And then um, we see, yeah, yeah, we see also cells that they are for very, very long times forming many, many short protrusions, and then they polarize. And here is the, the video. So this uh, is, is kind of sensing around what is going on. It forms many of these uh, short dendritic protrusions. And then at some point it polarizes and it moves. Um, so then uh, this, this was the, the third kind of, of pattern that gave us an idea of, of we can now with these kind of methods being able to detect different roles for these protrusions. And actually, if we compute it for the whole data, um, here in the color you see uh, the, the, this effective displacement. So these cells are moving a lot. These are not moving uh, basically just static. These cells are forming many protrusions a long time. And uh, these cells, on the contrary, they form very um, few protrusions. So then uh, this idea of having the different roles and maybe uh, being this an evidence to go into fluorescence and more molecular uh, kind of imaging is, is, is quite nice. So, so then we can start distinguishing patterns. And this, of course, um, it's a different way of analyzing data. So in biology, usually you have an hypothesis and then you develop the method for it. Here, what we did was to analyze the data, extract information, and now we have an hypothesis for the next uh, kind of, of experiment. And, and, and this is a bit tricky. This is not published yet. So we are working on that because it's a different way of, of thinking. And uh, well, uh, in my case, I'm, I'm super happy because uh, we didn't really know about this before. So that's another thing, and it's okay. You, you analyze all this data. And when you try to apply it to a real case, you end up with uh, thousands of, of, of data points, right, for each of the cells. And this is something that happened during the, the PhD. So we had to analyze big data. In particular, uh, we were working with, uh, with Alexandra. She was uh, studying different uh, chemotherapy cocktails for the cells to see how to stop uh, migration and uh, motility. And she was uh, using uh, Taxol, it's a microtubule stabilizer. So what it does is it doesn't let cells polymerize in microtubules, so it doesn't allow them to grow in this way. So then usually they get arrested. Arrested is when the cell gets in a static phase before mitosis and usually it dies. And it's a very nice uh, way to block um, uh, uh, metastasis. Um, but here, in, independent of the of the biological thing, we were analyzing the data. Here you see the arms that I was telling you. This we curated it manually, and then uh, I gave the data. I computed the round the roundness index because it's a very nice feature to actually distinguish between these cases here and the cells that are treated with Taxol. And I give her the data like that, and then she she told me, well, but give me the statistical significance, right, Bef between these distributions. And uh, and I did the test, and everything was statistically significant. So all the p-values were very very small because you have thousands of points, and this is kind of obvious. And then I said, like, well, look, they are different. These two distributions, and you don't need a p-value. And then uh, then he said, well, you are the mathematician. You need to give me something to say in my paper that these are different. And um, then we started with, with these things, getting a bit crazy. I was a bit angry because I didn't really like statistics and I really, I really didn't want to go into the p-value thing. Uh, but then I was very angry because everyone was using the p-value. Uh, so then we, we started on a project about first showing that the p-value depends on the data size and it's really a random variable and you should stop using it, but then giving an alternative to it. And, um, so here, the main problem is that when we increase, increase the data, 
we increase the accuracy in the estimators. And this, that's why the more data we have, the better, right, for our models. So here you have a confidence interval uh, for the mean value of different normal distributions. So if, if there's anything uh, that is not clear, please ask me, okay? Uh, because this will get a bit more technical now. Um, so basically, you see when you have very few samples, this I did it uh, with um, Monte Carlo, so I computed many confidence interval for many, many um, different uh, random samples following these distributions. And we see that at the beginning, there's some overlap. But as long as you increase the sample size, of course, the confidence interval around the mean is thinner and thinner and thinner until convergence. And then there's no overlap between the, the distributions. So if you compute a p-value here with this data, you will get a completely different result from what you will get if you had, uh, I don't know, 300 uh, points, right? And this is what we actually see here. So if we compute the typical uh, student's t-test between these two distributions, it's gonna tell us uh, here that they that we should reject the null hypothesis of being uh, of belonging to the same distribution. Here we shouldn't reject it. Here uh, we should reject it, and so on and so on. And they are basically data from the same distribution. Uh, so then we can say, okay, the p-value is kind of a random variable. Yeah, and you shouldn't use it. Uh, but then not only that, if we compute the p-value for different sample size many, many times, like uh, 1,000 times for each these different sample size, there's a pattern, there's a distribution, and there's like a, like a decreasing pattern. So not only is a random variable, it also depends on the sample size. And then um, this was very nice because this curve, if you know about uh, mathematics, you will see that it looks like an exponential function. And everything that works with exponentially is actually great in math because you can do whatever you want. Uh, so then we say, OK, can we model the p-value as an exponential function? Yes, we can. And uh, that's proven in the, in the paper. Actually, there's uh, also more theoretical proof that the p-value depends on the sample size. Uh, but I won't show it here. Um, and actually, this relationship is known since many, many, many years ago, but still in science, we keep using the p-value. So that's what I got here before submitting the paper, a very um, expert in the field, old, he told me, yeah, yeah, this is known. And then I was like, yeah, but then why are we using this? You know, if, if everyone knows that this happens, and it's because we are lazy as uh, scientists, right? When we want evidences. So basically what we did is, okay, I'm gonna compare the normal <laughs> distribution with the zero mean value um, and, and one standard deviation with different normal distributions that change the, their mean value. The standard deviation, it, it belongs the same. And when I compare them, I see at the beginning, of course, the p-value is a uniform uh, kind of variable. So, so yeah, because basically these two and these two are the same uh, distributions. And then as long as the differences are more evident, my curve decreases faster and faster and faster. So basically, if I have this model, my C is going to increase. Uh, and this is what you see here. So then we have a way to somehow plot uh, uh, the differences between uh, data. And then we, we kept going on with our idea of providing some way to say when your data really shows uh, significant or important differences. And then we say, OK. This is the, the p-value, okay? These are two different cases. If the new hypothesis should be rejected because indeed you have distributions that are quite different, then your p-values should be below the alpha significant threshold quite quick. You know, you shouldn't need too much data to see these differences. While if the new hypothesis uh, is not so evident to reject it, you will need quite a lot of data, like 1,000 points to really see differences. And this, in math, is the same as computing an integral. So basically, you compute um, uh, the distance for each of these time points, so here. So basically, you compute the area. And uh, what we said is like, okay, then we define this area under the curve. This is AP, and this area under alpha. So if there's an important or a significant difference, this area should be smaller than this area here. And that's how we compute this distance. And we say, OK, we will reject new hypotheses whenever this, uh, sorry, this case, this area is smaller. And, um, and then, of course, if you 
compute the area to the infinite, this area is going to be larger always. So then uh, we are only interested in the convergence uh, area of the curve, right? Uh, so, so the I mean, I, I, I show you at the beginning, there's one point from for which our uh, estimators will converge to a value. So we are only interested in the elbow of this curve. And, um, and this is called the, the convergence point. And actually the convergence point, it will increase also uh, as long as our data is uh, more and more similar. Um, so with this, uh, basically this is the, the workflow we, we propose. So you have your, your, your distributions, your sample, you can do the p-value randomizing with cross-validation um, uh, your samples, you, you, uh, you fit the exponential model, and then you get the, the C parameter and you can compare the, the, um, the two areas under the curve and get when it is uh, statistically significant or not to, to your, the conditions you're analyzing. And all this code is open, is used, and it's actually already being used in, in some papers. Um, so going back to the problem we had to solve to show you that it works, not only with normal functions, because actually, I mean, the p-value can compete with different uh, statistical tests that adapt well to your data distribution. It's not only relying on the student's t-test. So then we analyze the data with this. We saw the course. So basically, these two conditions, sorry, are not very different among them. So the exponential function, it takes more time to, to converge. And the others, they converge quite fast because these two cores are very different from this uh, uh, distribution here. And then we compute the, the A and C parameters. And we actually see that the C parameter for these uh, two models are quite high. Um, then we, so yeah, well, Taxol has an effect, as we saw in the images, um, and it was clear here, but uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so now everyone was very happy. Um, so another case we had, and this for me was more interesting. Uh, we had a project where uh, they were seeing if cell motility and cell morphology changes with the age you have. So if your age, can be seen in uh, in uh, epithelial cells, cells from your skin, and in this work they actually show that. But I and and here you can see, for example, the colors is the age of the patients that donated the the cells, the skin cells, and you can see the nuclear size it increases with the age, so it's bigger and bigger. Um, and we actually analyze the data and we see that actually if you do you perform this kind of method. It's not only about seeing where whether there are difference or differences or not, but also to know what are the features that contain that kind of information. So the nuclear area, of course, we saw it, and we you see that there's an increasing pattern. Um, the nuclear short axis, so I mean, if the nuclear area changes, probably the the shape also changes. And however, the orientation of the nuclei is this this little thing here it doesn't really tell you anything about the age of the patient. So you can uh, still see um, also what features or, or get a little bit more knowledge of the, of the quantitative data you get from your analysis. Um, so with this, I don't know if you have questions because I will switch the topic a little bit now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this is uh, all the math has finished uh, and uh, quantitative uh, methodological things. I'll show you uh, another kind of projects in which I've been involved uh, during these uh, years that are more community related projects, I would say. So um, we use deep learning for our, bi our biological problem, but uh, the true thing is that deep learning and uh, computer vision in biomedical analysis and so on is also a very hot topic and it's something that has a huge potential because we have more and more data and everyone nowadays wants to use it in their in their research right and uh, in the case of microscopy it's quite important not only because we can do quantification but because we can also push uh, the limits of the microscope so we can reduce the the laser powers we can reduce the number of channels, and then we can get more samples, sample friendlier kind of acquisition um, uh, setups. Mm -hmm. um, so in this line, yeah, deep learning is very cool, but people need to use these tools. And this uh, very deep learning, it's the way I call it, that uh, comes from findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable uh, deep learning is uh, the kind of uh, 
topic in which uh, I've been working on a very last project. Um, we, we are involved, and when we say we, it's a lot of people that uh, we, I, I will introduce now, uh, is the Biomech model. So, so this is an initiative led by uh, Wei Ojiang, Florian Juk, and Anna Kreshuk. It's about building a, a model, so it's a web page where we put deep learning models, train it, and these models are documented. So you know what is the type of data you can analyze with them. You know um, what are the different uh, user-friendly and open source software in which you can use them. And you get also information about how to retrain many of the models, not all of them, but <coughs> the data, and who were uh, the developers who, who did the model and what are the publications uh, related to them. So it's really, a model zoo that rather than targeting developers, it targets life scientists. So it's really to, to use this technology. And um, it's uh, accessible uh, first because it's open uh, to anyone. So you put your model there and anyone can explore it and use it. But also because all these models are meant to be used in these uh, um, user-friendly tools in the community. And all the people involved in the project are the developers and researchers behind uh, these tools. So it's quite a big thing. And uh, the second uh, important thing about the zoo is that uh, we want all the models not only be usable in one software, but in all our software. So then uh, we define it in um, universal model format. Uh, that means that uh, you take a model, and if you want to use it in Fiji with DPMJ or in zero cost or uh, with the Stardust or with Elastic, you can use it. And it's uh, kind of similar to the bioformats for images that you can open the same image in, in different software or uh, programming um, uh, frameworks. And uh, this is the way it works, I think. Yeah. So you look for your model, always looking for the biological sample. You download it. You can also, so the first case is to use the model in the browser. This is a browser application. So you open the image in the browser, you choose the model, and it will run there without any installation. It goes quite fast, but if you go to the bioimage IO link, you can get it. You can open in Elastic and close the data. Take some time. or in Fiji. So basically, you in any of these softwares, the very nice thing is that you don't see code. You just choose the model by name because you know that's the one you want to use and you analyze the data. That's a bit the, the idea. So it's really target, targeting non-expert uh, uh, life scientists. And the reusability part, well, the, the web page is a software web page. Each model has a card and there are different buttons. So you have information about the license, the, the DOI, the publications, the images, uh, the example, and also the raw images to test the model with them. But also you can, uh, in some cases, run it in the browser. And in some other cases, you even have Jupyter notebooks and the training data set associated to it. So you could run the fine tuning and, and kind of uh, really use it with new data from your, from your experiments. So this um, belongs to a, a uh, very large project that was um, uh, granted uh, recently is the Europe Horizon Infrastructure Project. There's a kid in the picture. There's a kid in the picture. Eh? Kid in the picture. Yeah, 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 the kid attended the kickoff meeting. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so the project, well, I don't know. That's I official, have a here. <laughs> it's the official uh, picture of, uh, yeah. Don't ask me. So <laughs> the idea is that um, this is a consortium of uh, 11 different institutions. Uh, the PI is behind the software and the, and the research centers. And, and the idea is uh, we all together will try to bridge right uh, these two communities. And uh, well, not only, I mean, hiring people and developing these um, uh, softwares, but also there are gonna be calls for challenges and call for um, hackathons where where 
they want to target developers, but also life scientists come, expose their problem, decide which are research questions really that uh, from the developer side is interesting to face, and which ones can be systematically uh, solved with what exists now. So this is, I think it's very cool. It started this year and there are more and more things coming. And uh, with this, I would like to say a bit what I think is the future of, of merging this technology with the life sciences in the lab and how we use it in our lab, of course. So the first thing is that, uh, what well, you probably know from me, Matthew, most of us, we are uh, developing our tools and so on, but we have a huge, uh, we are doing a huge effort teaching uh, this technology in many conferences, in many workshops, and there are many initiatives not only Europe, also in the US, but I think Europe in that sense is, is quite uh, strong, um, uh, trying really to bring our work uh, to, to, to the lab. And um, the, you can see that also in the publication. So for example, you usually have a methods publication, a data publication, or a biological publication and or reviews. But now there are more and more publications that are there in, in between. They are not a review, but it's more like guidelines to, to see how to exploit uh, the technology, how to acquire the data. So really making this uh, technology uh, translational. And um, the second thing, and this is more the work we are doing in the lab, is that uh, um, the, the tendency is not to acquire the data and then analyze it, but do it in the loop. So you have experts that know how to analyze the data, or you have the software. And as, as long as you are acquiring the data, you analyze it and you adjust your experimental protocols also to get the, the images or the data in a way that they're optimal for the workflow. And it's not that you sacrifice the biological hypothesis, but it's more the quality of, of the, the results you get. So the better the data for the image analysis, the, the better the results you're gonna get or the faster. And here, for example, I'm showing you is the project we have about uh, drosophila embryo development. We want to analyze how is the rate of uh, cell divisions and so on. And of course, Mario, he's the, the biologist. He could just acquire the data and give it to me. Uh, but what we do in a study is I do the experiments and I go with him. And then uh, we even 3D print the devices, not because they are fancy, but because we can uh, make the microscope uh, not losing time and not moving the X. So then we don't need registration things. So we don't need to curate the data manually. And we even control temperature and, and all the conditions. So when we get the images, they are ready to be used. And, uh, and then, uh, yeah, we are both there even deciding the, Objective of the microscope, absolutely everything. So, so the, 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 then the results are quite good. And of course, we spend less time uh, repeating the experiment. Um, the second thing is more about developers. So most of the pipelines in artificial intelligence, they are experimental. It's not that you have a theoretical model that you can, once it is conceived, you can easily reproduce, but you need to fine tune the model. You need to deal with many uh, model dependencies. So. The cell tracking challenge, for example, it's been running for 10 years already. And at the beginning, it was very easy to reproduce their methods because they gave a compiled code that you could use with your data and that was it. Now they were doing the same, but with deep learning, I cannot just run the compiled code. I need to, to deal with the pre-processing, post-processing. And it was losing this reusability of the method. So we um, decided to, to conceive some guidelines. They were optional for all the developers if they wanted to make the code more um, accessible or easily computable, even if you are a computer scientist. And all of the, the participants decided to follow it and it was completely optional. So then from, from the computer science part, there's also like a, this awareness of, of knowing that the, the code needs to be used, otherwise nobody is gonna use it, cite it, or basically benchmark all these codes quite rapidly to, to go on. And the last thing in the, um, this, I'm, I'm sure you might will show something in the next years. It's about uh, not give, uh, not just having a model that uh, performs basically what we are telling in the ground truth, but being able to digest more raw information from biology. So, so being able to work with the weekly supervised methods to, to, for example, a very common pipeline is the biologist instead of segmenting all the cells, there's okay, these, 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 and these are cells. And then the model, because it's been trained already and it gets some uh, constraints with your localizations, it's able to segment the whole volume. And that is actually 
uh, we have a project that is working quite well. And I think this, well, in, in, in Siemens and Philips, I know they are using it already and it works quite nicely. So this is something we will see. So now, um, if you want to spread the word and uh, you like what I told you, um, we have open positions in the lab and this uh, imp implies working in the uh, AI for Life project I told you about, but also um, we are looking for a, a lab manager in the lab. So we work, as I told you, with a super resolution like uh, SMLM, uh, TIFF and uh, spin these things, but also with expansion microscopy, we now we are expanding what <laughs> arrives to the lab, basically. <laughs> so Mario goes and expands it. This is the zebra fish expanded by 10x. It was super impressive. This is GIST. Uh, that is really a micro um, organism. And uh, of course, we develop and we keep developing many software for, for super resolution. We are also working on 3D printed microscopes here. You see the, the backbone or the skeleton of a lattice sheet microscope that now is being uh, deployed. And the uh, postdocs in the lab, that uh, the ones we are bringing different expertise together with Ricardo. We are uh, Mario, he's a biologist. Bruno, he's a biochemist, com now uh, completely uh, moved into computer sciences. Uh, it's Hannah, she's a physicist expert in uh, single molecule organization microscopy, Simao in lattice uh, sheet microscopy, and uh, me, who for, you already know me. Um, and Portugal is super nice. So if you really have uh, someone that wants to move or is looking for a different kind of research or a new experience yeah. abroad, we are more than happy to, to welcome them. And uh, with this, I would like to thank all my uh, collaborators and people who helped me during all these years and uh, of course my, my current uh, lab. Yeah. yeah, questions from the audience? <laughs> I have a couple of questions or more like uh, curiosities. Yes. So one is that, um, well, I love the p-value work you did. I think this is, this is fantastic. I think it can be very controversial um, to <laughs> and I, I assume you you fight a lot to publish this because you go against all the the trend in in many different fields. So I was wondering if you at some point uh, consider, um, for example, taking all the papers published on a specific conference or a or, or a journal that were using the p value and had the data available to to compare. <laughs> and uh, maybe rebate the results using the, your approach. Uh, <laughs> I think that, no. that, that would make it a fantastic point for the for the method. Uh, yeah, it depends on what you want for your career. So, uh, yeah, so no, there are works uh, doing that. There have been some works that they took data from others and they show that. Uh, the true thing is that when you work, uh, in these kind of projects, you end up super tired because you need to fight. And then, so what we did, for example, because in the in the paper we showcased uh, um, uh, data analysis with our data, but we took data from flow cytometry, which is a very common case for having a huge amount of data, and we showed the same they did, but uh, so we we got similar um, conclusions but with our methods. And the thing is in flow cytometry, they average usually all the data points they have because otherwise everything is statistically significant. So then you remove a lot of uh, noise in the data. You, you take out a lot of information. So what we said is like, okay, you can do the same, but with these where you are exploiting all the data you have in your sample and, uh, but not, no. What is very <laughs> funny now, so the paper has been, uh, so there are some cases where they use the code and they analyze the data using this, especially in chemistry, because they're, so when you can model a p-value, one of the very nice things is that you don't need to get the thousands of data points to see what's the tendency. So in chemistry where they don't, uh, this, this paper was uh, in science, they are uh, trying to, to see some, uh, if they can uh, predict what are going to be the, um, the chemical interactions uh, with um, some um, organic uh, particle, they cannot compute the huge amount of data uh, they, they need for, for, for the accuracy of the estimators. But uh, using the, the, the method, they can see that the model is actually behaving 
in a more significant way that was was being used before. Uh, they are trying to predict something with uh, deep learning. So then that is super nice because then it gives the chance to people who doesn't have enough data points uh, to to argue this fact of, hey, I don't have a big enough N because the, the value of the N is the other thing, right? Everyone tries to get the end that gives significance. And then that's like cheating because then, yeah, no. Uh, and then there are many papers citing this to uh, avoid using the p-value. So they don't want to use the p-value and now they can say in the paper, we don't want to use it because it depends on the, and that is like, okay. <laughs> you need the paper too, yeah. Okay. But uh, no, not the other one, no. I think, I mean, uh, you want to make a, a statement and also you want your method to be used you need something like this because otherwise it's going to be something that appear one time and then people can use it as excuse not to put the p-values but um it could be very interesting to have uh, the support of, of uh, results like this i a couple of uh, years back there was this uh, this paper in in our field where they they published a, a lot of deep learning results but doing uh, random setting of the of the parameters because of course many people publish new methods and they compare with the existing methods but usually they apply or well, they spend more time tuning their own methods than the others so uh, in the end they show the results and they say okay look we are better than the the competitors and actually sometimes they use the p value as well yeah 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 i know I and know. these guys they took some some methods on some uh, conference and they 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 use the code and then I started using uh, random setting of the parameters, getting going better and better on the on the results, and they show the the different uh, curves over time. Yes. Uh, by setting more and more uh, parameters, yes. so they show they, they put an, a very nice uh, plot of the results as a as a function of the the budget that you have to spend on running on the GPUs all all these experiments. And then you see how the, the methods, that the ones that were on top, they were changing over time. Yeah, because this is also yeah. quite um, yeah. economic dependent. You have more time, and more, more computing power. You have more time to spend on, on doing this. And if you just do it for your method, your method is always going to be on top. It doesn't mean it's the best. And but here you can just take the... Yeah, yeah. The so I... And, and do it. Yeah, so... Even if people are going to hate you. The other half is... <laughs> The other one. I don't want to do that <laughs> because. Uh, I know you need a name behind you. Uh, yes. Institution or something like this. Oh, I can't do it anonymously or so. <laughs> but uh, I mean, because also, yeah, I I think, I mean, maybe you could do it with methods, right? That, uh, but you can take in biological data, showing that it's a bit tricky. So because. Uh, I mean, probably the person who was computing those p-values, maybe they didn't even know about this. That's also one of the problems because uh, many times in, in life sciences, people, they just compute the p-value, but they don't know the meaning of that. And that was one of the problems we saw with this. Uh, they were like, well, I just compute the no hypothesis test and, and that's it. And it's like a protocol. No, it's like yeah. cleaning your sample. It's something that they the can reviewer do. asks you to do it, and reviewers yeah. ask you to do it as well. So, I don't know. I think also this this problem of big data is becoming more and more, fa more famous. Uh, for example, in in genetics and in bioinformatics, they have also many methods to overcome this because I mean they are working with thousands of proteins and protein interactions. So there, they also have some other things, and um, and also. Um, one of the problems is I, I think you as a scientist, you shouldn't rely on an index that tells you what you did is good or right. Uh, so I think it's also a lazy way of of, of conducting, right? Like I, I do the p-value and then this is significant. No, look at your data. Uh, maybe, uh, and this in deep learning, we are seeing it in a different way. We should be able to work with uncertainties and uh, there's no black and whites always. And uh, when you don't have statistical significance, then maybe you just should do more research on that. And that's it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> but if you want to take the code, everything is open. You look for the... <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for a brave student. Uh, okay, 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 okay.
Yeah. Okay. And then I'll, uh, I don't know if anybody wants something. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> go, go. Ahead. I told. Okay. The one question that I have, I arrived uh, 10 minutes late. Yeah, yeah, don't you, worry. You said uh, what, I was gonna, what, I, what I'm going to do as well now. But uh, when you were showing the, the images uh, of, the, of the cells under the microscope yes. and identifying their shape, their movement, etc., is that something that can be done in real time in microscopes? Yeah. Or it is? That's okay. uh, something uh, we would like to do. So that works uh, from, uh, I cannot really remember the name of the researchers, but uh, one is the Institut Pesteur, and um, the other one is the other institute in France. So what they are doing is uh, with um, GIST. GIST is a very nice organism to track because the shape is, it's like a circle, but when it uh, divides, it gets like a blip and there's another circle. And they have a microscope that is analyzing the sh those shapes to decide yeah. when to increase, uh, when to image with fluorescence. And the other one is they have it uh, connected with uh, microfluidics. So then they decide to put more uh, glucose on the sample because they need to eat more or, I mean, GIST is a fermentation thing. So they, yeah, and, and they are doing that actually. And with GIST is super nice because here is more complicated, but. Uh, it's also very integrated in the software that comes with the microscope. The, the software is like a deep learning uh, toolbox that comes already with. Uh, but it does after the acquisition. So now um, in the lab, uh, Ricardo has a collaboration with Avelite, is the company that is build, building what they call next generation microscope. So basically, uh, the hardware can be very easily connected to, with software that we develop. And the, and the microscope, the system is made in a way that you can change between modalities on the loop. So you basically have this analysis on the fly and, uh, and then you can say, okay, now you, you image with the uh, TIFF or now you keep going on with DAC or now you do white field. Um, yeah. yeah, because I, then, yes. So for the convolution, Nikon has this super nice black box that, uh, you put the data, it gives it the decomposed image, and you don't know what the method is doing, but uh, but on the loop. Yeah. And the microscopy services at the university, they, they told me the the last microscopes, they, they come with that. In the loop? <coughs> but with for autofocus? No, no, for the, oh. the, the convolution, for example. Ah, yeah, yeah, and, and it's thing. impressive, eh? Looks pretty. It's a bit scary. I don't know how realistic it is. But... <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's pretty. Beautiful, but uh, you don't know. I mean, it's a trained model that mm -hmm. they don't tell you. So the with the convolution. Well, okay, yeah, this is another discussion. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask how this uh, huh? is because I, I don't know much about that. But then, so new commercial microscopes they already come with this uh, uh, let's say capacity of uh, acquiring the image, but then they are supposed to be dynamic so that, uh, as you have said, so they, they, they can change the, the mode of the microscope? Or yes, so the new microscope cannot uh, change like the acquisition, like track cells and say, okay, mm -hmm. I'm moving into this. What they do is the autofocus is super common. So autofocusing on the, on the loop. The convolving in the loop, no, that they do it afterwards. Um, you can you can create the pipeline to say when you want to change uh, the channels, the fluorescence channels, because maybe you don't want a, a uniform acquisition. But uh, yeah, but for the loop, I would say how to focus and and these kind of things is the most common one. Uh, the others, you when you buy the microscope, you buy the software, and the software has like a toolbox full of now AI. Uh, Post processing right. methods that I mean, for some are very, very good. The convolution is very cool. Yeah. Oh, any other question? Yeah. Yes. Coming back to the first part of your talk with the TCM, I didn't understand the model system that you that you built up. Is it really realistic? Does it really reproduce what we have in the body in the end? Okay. Because you talk mainly about ecology. Yes. So, but and you you didn't focus much on on the things that I think from my experience, but I've never worked with cancer cells must be important. That's first, the three-dimensional structure, the exact structure of what you're building up. And second, the exact chemistry. And in this case, I would say I'm right. I know that this is the case. The chemistry matters a lot. This is not just some protein. This is yes. a, a glycoprotein matrix that is super complicated. 
So how do we reproduce? How can we make a realistic system in the lab? Uh, while at the same time, of course, I have proof that you show the three dimensions, which are much more important than just putting it on a glass plate. And, yes. Uh, so uh, in the case of the extracellular matrix, it is composed by uh, elastin, uh, collagen type one, collagen type three and four. And the most, I mean, and more things, of course, but uh, in the stroma surrounding the tumor, the most common proteins are those. And collagen type one is the one of the most uh, uh, abundant uh, protein. So in this case, that's why they they are working with uh, cells embedded in, in matrices with collagen type one. That's the second thing. Uh, when you have a tumor, the uh, stiffness of the tumor, it changes gradually. And this means the porosity of collagen type one and the, the um, yeah, the, the cross-linking of the fibers and, and all these things. So for our studies, because we were more, uh, try, so, so when you develop these methods, the second thing is to, to analyze different conditions. So in the case of Hassini, she was analyzing uh, different stiffnesses of collagen type one. So basically they, um, increase or reduce the, the concentration when they build the matrices. And then uh, they also analyze the, um, the cell density because cells also, they polymerize, they polymerize the collagen matrices to, I, I think maybe I can show it here. Actually, uh, this researcher, he has very, very cool works on, on those lines. Um, yeah. So when the, 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 the cell is, so this is collagen type one also, but uh, with fluorescence. And uh, when the cell is moving, like, uh, yeah. it's when with the additions to the fibers, they do some uh, polymerization. So they change also the, some of the mechanical properties here and they leave, uh, maybe you cannot see very well, but they leave like a path that they use to actually migrate. So this is the reason why uh, we use collagen type one. There are other 3D matrices, of course, but uh, then building the extracellular matrix itself, I think it's super challenging because then you need all these proteins. I would be super happy to, to, to see it, but just with one protein, it was really a nightmare. So we tried to reproduce the protocol in, in Spain and there are like uh, many different ones. And uh, maybe if your lab has super constant conditions, like uh, really temperature, uh, humidity, and those things, you can reproduce it. But in a life sciences common lab, like a bench or whatever, it's not that straightforward. And, and the images, they all look different because you're completely right. But the whole 3D is to sell a matrix. I don't know. I mean, maybe you can take a biops and try to grow it but uh and by the way also the mechanical properties they're probably mainly measured in 2d the cells are immersed on uh, or immobilized on some glass plate not in the real system so yes i don't want to say it's wrong uh, no no so that, that no but the cells but we, we analyze uh in our case all our cells like uh we so then it doesn't use any 2d at all yeah. So because of that, uh, so basically they build the matrices, they put the cells there and they let them grow, uh, trying to, and that's why they don't want to use fluorescence either, because uh, it, it's like adding one more extra uh, factor. And uh, for the stiffness, well, actually, there's a very nice review from, from Danny and uh, Faisun on the three, on the mechanical properties of 3D migration. And there's another one also from uh, this same researcher, um, Doyle and uh, Kenneth Yamada. So I would say those are like the, if you are interested in mechanics of that, it's quite interesting. Yes. This was such a nice talk. Thank you. I loved it. I'm actually from the other side, so I work with cells. Okay. So I'm nice. molecular biologist. And well, the information of the people p-value was mind-blowing. I had no idea. Okay. <laughs> so for you guys, maybe it's common. For me, it was like, what? 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 Because it was everybody asks. Like, yeah. and so I'm actually working with movement in 3D with matrices, blah, blah, blah. And no one ever, like, it's what you said. There's so much variability with all these conditions that, like, you have to adjust the best as 
you can so to make like big comparisons so what everybody asks it's the p-value yeah but like so this was when just... I, you don't want to use it you can say yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's true i loved it because i had no idea so now my my real question since i'm working with this uh migration and i was so interested in this um uh, model zoo oh yeah but as i said so i don't know a lot about modeling and all these things so would it be accessible for me to go in this zoo and know which model should I use to analyze my data? Uh, in theory, yes, but then you need to try and tell me. Uh, so, so then, if um, I don't know what is the microscopy modality you are using or your for now confocal. So then you will go to the model two and you will write confocal microscopy, for example, and then you will see the models that have been training to analyze confocal microscopy. Now, let's say you want, you already know more or less what is the task you want to perform. So for example, you have epithelial cells and you want to segment the, the boundaries between them because you know, like to detect where are the junctions because that's a very nice way to segment them. So then you could look for boundary segmentation and, and look for it. So there are different ways. The idea is that you go and is similar to exploring Google, but you will explore for your, uh, you will search for your, your models. Okay. And there's a very nice thing also, you can always ask on Twitter in uh, the scientific forum, do you know the image SC forum? So it's similar to Stack Overflow for, um, I don't know, people doing programming or whatever, but it's for biologists and people working on bioimage uh, data analysis. Uh, Ignati is there, I'm there and everyone is there. So you just pose your question, hey, I need to analyze this. I have no idea how to do it. Can anyone help me? And they will answer you in less than 24 hours. Someone there, for That's sure. Sorry. What was the image today? dot S from scientific, C from uh, cute. Image dot S C. S C. That's it. Yeah. I'm going to try it. Thank you. And one last question. Yeah. Which uh, so, which microscope do they use without fluorescence? Yeah, uh, for the face contrast. Yes, Oof, that there you catch me because actually they change it. So it was uh, some microscope from Olympus back in the time. But you mean the microscope of the objective or no? Like how they were doing it without fluorescence. fluorescence. Mm -hmm. So they were using basically face contrast. It's is like um, transmitted light microscopy. Like DAC. Okay. And you just focus the plane. And in this case, it was a 10x objective. Um, but I'm not sure if I understand the question. So I was asking this because it's like the images are so clear. I was this wondering. Ones? This? Not those ones so much, but like the one that you just had. And maybe it was just one image. Well, they are um, a bit like this, eh? Okay. Uh, I don't know. I was wondering if it was this new technology because I heard. No, 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 I no. was you doing this. Um... No, no. These images were acquired in 2015. I see. Okay. And now they changed the microscope. <laughs> That's I know for sure. Uh, but they, I mean, <clears throat> they look like this. So it's basically it's face contrast. Uh, okay. And the the background it depends on what is the. Sorry. Thank you. Um, have you tried with real uh, human tumor cells? No. <laughs> if your cell number is so slow as you have show us, you can try to isolate a specific type of cells and that in the put it, them in the matrix and so track them i don't know yeah so that is what uh, they are doing oh, okay. in your home <laughs> so they are getting samples but getting a uh, patient samples is not that uh, easy in this case they are uh, uh, human wild type uh, fibrosarcoma cells um what they do is they basically um grow some tumors in mice yeah. 
in mice and then um, they extract the cells from there and they cultivate them. But really from humans, so I know then he had um Modeni and Praful. So they were working with so uh, mammalian cancer cells, but it's not that uh, yeah, it's not that easy. So they had some collaborations, but those are super expensive. Also because you need many patients. So and uh, those cells are more used uh, to get a genetical signature of different tumors. So there are research on those, but they don't sacrifice that rich data that much for, for cell motility uh, studies. They use mice as normally. Yes. Have you tried with another system of growing cells, either stem cells, for instance? You can go with uh, yeah. spheres and... Those again, I mean, I love stem cells yeah. uh, for several reasons also. With, I mean, but uh, yeah, again, it's... Uh, so those, for me, it's impossible to get those cells. You really need to get a collaborator that is a biologist because the, I mean, the protocols to extract stem cells is... Yeah, it, it's, I mean, you really need to take them from the backbone and so on, so... Um, yeah, I mean, it would be super cool to, to have someone that, uh, and also many times you depend on doctors, and that's uh, the second part of the story. Okay. Uh, you can do it with your cancer cell line. I mean, instead of using the uh, 230 yeah. line, you can use, well, I don't remember, but uh, you have one in Lyama with this new yeah. six with make spheres in, in cell line. I mean, you, you don't need patients. No, no, that yeah, that's true. Uh, but also note that I didn't do the experiment. So this was really like a collaboration. Yeah. I mean, I will be super yes. happy. Yes. And that's why in the lab we're doing, but uh, in ITC, for example, that would be the starting point. There's no people working with stem cells as far as I know. Um, and what with glion, glion, uh, glion plus. Yeah, the glioblastos from glioblastoma yeah. are a completely different story. We analyze some of them and they are static there. And just That's like why. Neurons. I mean, and, because uh, this cell line is very specific in breast cancer. And yeah. And they have different type of migration. So sure. there can be uh, something different between cell lines and between human cells, of course. Yeah, sure. What, um, I mean, what is my... I hope I can do it one day because there are different motility patterns, but I think uh, the way microtubules and actin is being polymerized according to the motility shouldn't be that different between cell types because I, I mean, the microtransaction process should be kind of similar. The addition, so I hope one day I can find someone who has the ability to perform those uh, experiments and combine them. You mm -hmm. don't know the, the molecular pattern of the cells that migrate with these um, tools. Sorry, um, you don't know the molecular pattern of these cells migrating. Uh, no, no, we don't have it. So it could be like a much more controlled experiment where you can say, okay, now the cell is really attaching and making the displacement, or with these uh, smart microscopes. Um, that's the other part. Yeah, yeah. One time. <laughs> okay. Thank I you. think we're going to leave it here. So I just thank the speaker you. again. <laughs> so, Iran, too, if you want to make your question online, then we'll answer later. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Ah. And then you can check the. The chat, but there's nothing in the chat. Yeah, because Maybe. because they cannot post in the chat. There's questions. She just said, "Thank you very much, nice talk," and but she she raised the hand. I don't know. Um, I think it's. I will leave my email address here. Okay. <laughs> Sí, sí, sí. 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 Sí, sí, sí.
O sea, yo casi siempre, y he trabajado con los tipos celulares, no sé qué, y han entrado, pero no sé, ¿cómo que lo ves desde el Bueno, voy a decir, poder las distintas cosas, pero al final. Gracias. ¿Pero cuál es tu background? Es que me, eh, lo siento, tu nombre y todo. No, pues yo, pues Nike. Y he estado trabajando en Lisboa como postdoc y ahora me he venido a Biodonosti. Ah, Biodonosti, vale. Sí. Y nada, estamos intentando ver, pues eso, cómo migran las células de cáncer de mama. Sí, pero con eso, y estamos pues, tomando hidrogeles, con distintas tiras, sí. todo eso, o sea, todas las cosas que estás diciendo, tipo. Sí. ¿Con quién estás trabajando? Eh, Amaya Citicia y, bueno, un poco con María Cacarón también. Sí. Vale. No es por saber psicología, porque, bueno, mi supervisora de tesis, que es con quien he hecho todo esto, eh, antes estaba en el CIMA de Navarra, de hecho, por eso conozco a Ignacio. Y yo sé que ha tenido alguna colaboración con gente de Donosti, lo voy a decir, me pierdo un montón en las redes, aquí lo paso a llegar hacia afuera. Eh, bueno, voy a cerrar ya aquí.